All right, before we discuss uh, interrupt implementation, we're going to do a quick review you know, of what an interrupt you know, actually is. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a topic that's very important in embedded systems, but you know, I, I don't think it's hit enough at the university level because event, interrupt-driven programming is, is very, very important. Um, so the idea of these slides is not to give you a particular implementation for any processor, but just to introduce some of the terminology and give you a general overview of how interrupts work in general, regardless of the processor you may be using. So an, another, another term you'll probably hear, right, and you will if you, you read the R manuals, is exceptions. Um, a, a lot of times exceptions and interrupts are used you know, interchangeably. And there's different definitions depending on architecture and who wrote the manual of what an exception is. But generally, it's any event that can alter the normal CPU um, execution flow. Um, the, uh, anything that can flag the CPU to stop what it's doing and do something else. If that's an exception. So it's generally accepted that interrupts are a subset of exceptions. Interrupts are something that can stop uh, the processor from doing what it's doing and alter you know program flow, but exceptions encompass more than than just interrupts. And, and what we mean by that, an exception are generally you know include in, what I call internal events that are abnormal. When I say internal, things that may be internal to the actual CPU core itself. Um, for example, if it decodes an invalid instruction. Uh, can generate an exception if there's some sort of illegal bus access, meaning you know tried to accept you know go to you know an address that doesn't exist or um, some kind of fault condition. Uh, something that's definitely inside the core. Where interrupts are generally not always this this isn't always the true, but generally when we talk interrupts, we're talking about hardware-driven signals, meaning signals that come into the CPU uh, from you know hardware from a peripheral, um, you know, maybe an external signal line outside of the microprocessor, you know, but we're, we're, we generally talk about peripherals and hardware and we talk about interrupts, but interrupts are exceptions. They alter normal program flow. So to give you an idea of why we want interrupts, because you might ask, well, why, why in the world would we want to ever interrupt program flow? You know, I want my program to be deterministic uh, and kind of do the same thing all the time. Well, it, it actually makes a lot of sense once you un understand what an interrupt is. So I have a cartoon here where I kind of have drawn, there's a CPU executing some main program, and I just kind of have a graphic here saying it's looping around and around and around. And let's say in some microprocessor that kind of is all around that encloses all of these uh, items, you know, we might have like a UART, you know, it, it's, it's doing something, analog digital converters, it's doing something, and maybe we have a timer. Um, and the program has to interact with these things, maybe it has to receive data um, and transmit data over the UART, maybe uh, the ADC is recording some sort of, you know, uh, sensor, and we have a timer kind of ticking away to, to schedule events. Um, we've got to have the main program and the CPU to kind of talk to these uh, peripherals and interact, interact with our main program. Well, one, one way of doing it, which is often a way if you're just starting out with a new peripheral, you've just started programming it, is use a technique called polling. You know, polling is pretty simple. All it is is your main program, while doing everything else it has to do, it's simply... Um, one at a time will go through any peripheral it needs to service and kind of uh, inquire the device as to status. For example, the question mark in this case may mean I'll read a register to see if a transmit done or there's a receive uh, completed. Um, I might pull the ADC to see if my last conversion's done or I might pull the timer to see if uh, you have, you know I, I've captured a signal or timeout. So. If you can imagine your main program just continually pulling these things, uh, and it's doing other things as well, this technique certainly works, um, and it's it, it's easy to do. But th there's a big problem here: is that often these peripherals operate 
um, whether it be the, the rate at which they produce data or the rate at which they do their job, is much, much slower than the CPU is clocked at. You know, this might be clocked at 48 megahertz, but this might be a 9600 baud UART. I mean, we're talking about forever in terms of the microprocessor's time frame of when a byte goes out. So to sit and wait for something, or even the poll to wait for something to be done, is kind of a waste of time, you know, uh, from the CPU's point of view. It's easy to understand. There's one main program flow, which is ask the question. So interrupts look at the the per, you know the problem from a different perspective so think of think of another analogy is ima imagine the main program is like your boss at work you know your boss has lots of jobs you know other than your your supervisor or manager then you know checking on what the employee is doing but you know if the boss simply his only job was to keep asking maybe the you know these are his three subordinates what are you doing what are you doing what are you doing continuously it, it's, it's a waste of his time um, so interrupts is a different technique using interrupts to kind of do the same job but make better use of the CPU time. So the basic idea here is instead of the main program continually asking, you know, these peripherals, you know, are you done yet? What are you doing? Why not have the peripheral tell the CPU when it's done doing something or something happened? So for example, the ADC, um, Maybe it's done converting a you know uh, a you know a conversion. It, it grabbed the data um, from a sensor, so it could raise a flag, which quite literally is just a hardware line, a logic line, saying, um, "Hey, I'm done." Then the main program can come back and say, "Okay, you're done. Would you get done? Give me your data." Then the UART can do the same thing. Maybe he he just received a byte. From a you know from you know the external world, so he can generate an interrupt saying, "Hey, I've got a byte." The main program can respond back and grab that byte. Likewise, the timer can, you know, fire whenever it has an event, and the CPU can do what it needs to do. This makes a lot more sense in that if these guys operate at you know an order of magnitude slower than the main program, meaning the rate they produce data. You know, you don't want to waste time for the main program asking them when they're done. It makes sense to have them flag the main program, your, your main routine, so the main program can do other operations um, in its foreground loop, um, maybe printing the screen or, or something, some other logic. This, this is, the, in the heart, interrupt-driven programming, where you, each piece of hardware has a task and it flags them, you know, the, it, it generates a flag whenever you know it's done now this is how interrupts and exceptions work across almost any processor platform um, so what happens uh, when an interrupt or exception occurs and what I'm about to describe to you this is a general process every implementation is a little different but in general I don't care what processor family you're using this always you know these steps generally occur so the first thing the CPU has to do, um, if he's in the middle of doing something in the main program, he just can't leave immediately. He has to do what's called saving context. And all that means is he's got to remember where he is at. Uh, so you've got to record the program counter, you know, any CPU registers, any information he needs so when he comes back to the main program, he can pick up uh, right where he was at. So from the main program flow, it looks like nothing ever happened. Now, the mechanism that's usually used for this is a CPU stack. It, everything is pushed onto the stack. Um, some architectures do this automatically. Uh, some architectures uh, will s save the program counter, but you, you know, the interrupt routine has to save you know, registers. Um, so what happens then, once the context is saved, um, the CPU has to know where to go and what to execute whenever uh, this interrupt occurs. So he has to get the um, address of the interrupt service handler, also sometimes called the interrupt service routine, ISR, from what's called a vector table. It's just simply a table in memory, um, in flash or RAM, that has addresses of all the interrupt service handlers. Um, in some architectures, is actual executable code at each location. Some architectures is an address. 
Um, but the concept is the same. It's just a table that contains information about what to do whenever there is an interrupt. Um, so whenever you, a processor um, is designed, you know, the designer will map out a certain number of interrupt sources and kind of assign them an index. So, for example, the UART may be at index 20, so the CPU would go to, like, table entry 20 and look there for the address um, of the interrupt handler. So once that happens, the CPU jumps to the interrupt service routine, the interrupt service handler. Um, the interrupt service handler is simply code. It just does something. It, it, the, 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 it's like jumping to another little mini program. Um, and in that, you might clear some flags, uh, do some operations. Some peripherals require you to clear an interrupt flag, the thing that generated the actual interrupt. Others don't. Others simply jumping to the interrupt will clear the flag. But that's something you dig in a peripheral manual when you read about the peripheral and its interrupts. Uh, but, but you do something. Then the when it's all done, the interrupt service handler exits. M oh, most architectures, there's actually a special instruction to tell the CPU, um, I'm just not returning from any subroutine, I'm returning from an interrupt. Uh, there's like a RET I instruction versus a return or RET, um, RET. Uh, some architectures don't. Some it's kind of magical where interrupt handling routines are no different than any other, say, function. But the interrupt handler has to exit, and when it exits, the CPU says, oh, you're coming back from this interrupt routine. The CPU has to restore its context um, and return to whatever it was doing before. So what, what that means is all that stuff that was on the stack, the program counter registers, get, uh, get restored. And then the main program doesn't even really know anything's happened. You would have to flag it in some other way. It just thinks it always had control of the CPU, and it comes back. So what's kind of cool about this, if you have multiple interrupts, you can have multiple handlers having, like, think of them as little mini programs that get executed whenever this hardware event happens. Um, so what this, you, you in effect, get here, you don't really get any extra CPU time. All you're doing here is dividing it up in you know, a more rational way, uh, in a way that um, is more efficient. So the CPU doesn't have to sit around and wait for a peripheral to be done. You know, the peripheral or that piece of hardware can flag the microprocessor and say, hey, I'm done, I need, I need service. And this kind of makes sense in my early example you know, of kind of like your supervisor um, asking his subordinates, are you done, are you done? Well, how about this? How about the, the supervisor gives each a task to do, and when that task is completed, they'll, they'll be done. So, for example, the UART, that subordinate might take a week to do. You know, the ADC might be a day and a time or two days. The, you know, the, the, the supervisor doesn't have to ask every hour, are you done? They can come back and ask, you know, and tell the, the supervisor when they're done. Um, so I, I always like to use that analogy. Um, likewise, you know, you don't have to burn up CPU cycles polling for things. Um, you can use these interrupts. The, the most difficult thing for, for people to, to, to grasp when, you, when you're learning interrupts is how to kind of code for them. Because your main program... Those interrupts may fire at any time. They may flag, so you kind of have to design your program um, so it works somewhat asynchronously. Your program doesn't necessarily start at the top and go to the bottom. You have these extra processes, almost these little programs executing, you know, in somewhat parallel. There's only one CPU in most cases in these microcontrollers, but think of them as like parallel processes, except they're time to certain you know, uh, events like a UART data receive, um, analog digital converter being converted, or a timer, you may be timing out. Um, so you can use your CPU time more efficiently.